<laughs> All right. Good afternoon, and welcome to the 695th meeting of the Economic Club of New York. I'm John Williams. I'm the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and, and Chair of this club. Now, it's an honor to be with you here, uh, with all of you, to kick off the 2023 <laughs> season here at the club. The Economic Club of New York is known as the nation's leading nonpartisan forum for discussions on economic, social, and political issues. Over the past three years, through our diversity, equity, and inclusion programming, we've been leveraging the club's platform to bring together prominent thought leaders to help us explore and better understand the various dimensions of inequity and in underrepresented communities. And our guests highlight strategies, best practices, and resources that the business community can use to be a force for change. We're not doing this work alone. We would like to give special thanks to our corporate partners, BlackRock, MasterCard, uh, PayPal, S&P Global, Taconic Capital, as well as the many members, speakers, and subject matter experts that are now and will be engaged in this work. Now, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to students from Mercy College and the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University who are joining us virtually today, as well as our largest ever Class of 2023 fellows. I'm honored to welcome our special guest today, Ursula Burns. Ursula is currently the chairwoman of Taneo and was chairwoman and CEO of Xerox Corporation. She joins Xerox as a summer intern in 1980 and has since held leadership posts spanning corporate services, manufacturing, and product development. As CEO, Ursula helped the company transform from a global leader in document technology to the world's most diversified business services company, spearheading the largest ac acquisition in Xerox history, the $6.4 billion purchase of affiliated computer services. And after her retirement from Xerox, she held positions, uh, the positions of chairwoman and CEO of Vion Limited. She's a member of a uh, number of boards and provides leadership counsel to several community educational and nonprofit organizations and was previously appointed by President Obama to lead the White House National Program on Science, Technology, and Engineering, and Math and served as chair of the President's Export Council. Now, the format today will be a conversation and we're delighted to have club member and principal of Heyday, Fred Hochberg, as our moderator. So as a reminder, this conversation is on the record as we do have media on the line. So Fred and Ursula, if you're ready, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. So Ursula took 695 meetings to I, I was, I, I, When he said 695, I was like, OK, I thought I was early in the cycle. I guess. We, felt, we felt kind of special, but <laughs> we're <not>. feeling, <laughs> I guess they got ran out of people, so we got to 695. So um, uh, we'll try and do the best we can. OK, so uh, we're going to do about what, 30 minutes, just the two of us, and then we'll open it up. Uh, and uh, if I had my way, I could just sit and talk to us for two or three hours, as we've often done. So one, uh, part of the base of this book, and to sell books today, I mean, that's part of I'm, It's probably against every club rule to do this. But uh, this is a spectacular book. Um, I both read it and did the Audible. Actually, Audible lost all my notes, so I had to reread it to get all my notes back. But it is a great book. So if you have not read it, and it's now even in paperback. I went to buy one at Barnes & Noble today, but they were already sold out. So uh, you can get it from Amazon or online. They'd be thrilled to sell it to you. Uh, Ursula and I actually met, uh, I checked, we met in 2010 <clears throat> when she was co-chair of the President's Export Council. Um, and as part of that, she took a delegation to Turkey um, which I missed, and as a result, I am not mentioned once in this book. <laughs> not a single mention. The vice chair of Exim Bank, who over there, she gets a beautiful mention, but I sorry, was left sorry. at the curb. So, um, just to set the stage here. Um, so I thought we would talk a little bit about Ursula's background, her personal life, time at Xerox, um, and as John mentioned, uh, Ursula has been very eloquent on issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, did a recent uh, interview on CNBC about that. We'll talk about that. And kind of where we see the future. And we should wrap up around 4.30 or something like that. So I think we'll be fine. So maybe you could just tell, me, tell everybody briefly, because it's an unusual title. Where did the title come from? Yeah, my, my uh, mother, I'm one of these typical immigrant, poor immigrant black kids. My mother came over from Panama 
She was a single mom. She wasn't single when she came, but by the time she landed here and got settled, my father had exited stage left. Uh, she, high school diploma, pretty standard, literally poverty-stricken um, immigrant. We lived on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And she had one set of assets in the world, and she made that clear to us, that she had one set of assets, and it was my brother, my sister, and I, and that she, her job was to make sure that we became assets to the world, positive assets to the world. So she, would, she came up with all these crazy statements, which when I was living through them, you know, all you could do is tune them out and say, this is like, do I have to hear this again? You know, and one of them was, God doesn't like ugly. She said that continuously. She would say, um, the world doesn't happen to you. You have to happen to the world. She said, it's uh, where you are. It's not who you are. And remember that when you're rich and famous. Now, for my mother to say, and remember that when you're rich and famous, is such a bizarre thing. Because this was before the internet, before anybody knew about rich and famous. I mean, how do we know about rich and famous? And she had absolutely no idea that I would be sitting here. Actually, it wasn't even. I had no idea I'd be sitting here, so I know she didn't have any idea that I'd be sitting here. So when I started working and moving through corporate life and, and social life in general, I realized that there was always these options I had to actually kind of give in, to trade the card, and um, to become like, to conform, to take a shortcut. So whatever. And this statement was in the back of my head all the time. So that w you have to make sure that you understand who you are. And that who you are doesn't change because, you became, because you're poor. And that who you are doesn't, definitely doesn't change when you become rich and famous. And so I've, had to, I've navigated my life around this thing, around this whole statement of remember, remember. Uh, as John mentioned, we have a number of students online and there are a number of people here who also are in positions where they might mentor. You talk a lot in the book about mentoring. You talk about your, your late husband, Vernon Jordan, President Obama, many white executives at Xerox. And one of the things I came away with reading the book was finding ways to both stand out and fit in, and how many people have that dilemma, uh, particularly if they're not part of the white, straight, male hierarchy. So any particular thoughts you have on that that you might yeah, I had the greatest teachers in this. I mean, I didn't, I kind of knew how to stand out without trying because I didn't look like anyone else, as you can tell. I've kind of done the best that I can at my New York City accent and... And you're wearing black. Huh? You're wearing all black. And I'm all, yeah. This is the color, this is what people tell me is the color of my skin. I'm all black. Uh, I'm a girl. I was poor. <laughs> so all these things that I, that I knew I was. But anyway, I had, so standing out, being different, wasn't really that hard. Not that I was trying to be, it's just that people actually identify you as one. The other difference, by the way, was I was an engineer. I studied un undergraduate and graduate degrees in engineering. And I actually worked as an engineer in a place, so I was just very odd. Uh, what was hard for me was actually that there's a point where that difference becomes an, a massive inhibitor. Because, and, and you just don't, you're not, it, that difference actually is rigidity around learning new approaches and learning new things. So I had to step back and I had a lot of help. My husband was great help. My husband was uh, 20 years older than I am. I was, I am now still. He passed away in 2019, way before COVID started, which is good. Um, and he was an engineer at the company, a scientist at the company. He had 84 patents at Xerox, amazing guy, amazing guy. Um, and he would always tell me that basically you, you're like way out there. You've got to kind of come closer to where everybody is. You know, you, I know that you're a black woman and I had this massive afro and everything about me was like just, look at me, I'm different. Physically, but also in the approach to things. And she, he said, you just got to close the gap a little bit because people can't, halfway is not even close enough, right? That was one. And the other person who was really good at this was Vernon. Vernon Jordan, very good friend of mine, very good friend of, of um, Mr. Hochberg's here. He was just an amazing mentor and guide for me. And he would, he would call me on everything. Like, 
If I went to a meeting dressed, a board meeting dressed inappropriately, I was a young engineer presenting to the board all the time, and he would write me a note and say, um, let's talk after. <laughs> Which was always, in the beginning I was like, oh, this is gonna be fun, right? <laughs> let's talk after, he, I remember one day he told me, for example, let's talk after I come, he says, you know, you have to wear holes. I said, what? By the way, he was wrong. But he was, you know, it was his point of view, and he was always watching to see whether or not I could close this gap between where I was and where people were enough that I don't lose my soul and you know, who I am and close the gap. And he, was, he called me on everything, how I dressed, how I spoke, you know, whether I was respectful to people. He was just an amazing guy, amazing. So I had a lot of people who were rotating around me who helped to have me fit in a little bit more. Because like I said, being outside was pretty normal, so I knew how to do that. Well, well, Vernon, if you went to see Vernon Jordan and did not have a necktie on, you might as well just turn Literally. around and go. Yeah. We had a, we had a lunch for him um, two weekends ago at the Alpha, Alpha Club. He, he used to put on this lunch, and we sent out the invitation. He came and I, I, I said to them in the invitation something like, dress as you may, or something like business casual. I got there and realized, oh my God. You know, the that, he's passed away last year. He's looking down at this room, so I literally sent out an email to everyone saying, please, please, wear a tie. <laughs> find a tie, find a tie. He's not even here, but please wear a tie. And that's what everybody did. He had one person who didn't. It was Jamie Diamond, by the way, so I guess. <laughs> but everybody wore a tie, because he, he called it like he saw it. Like I said, he was not always correct, but he was clear-minded and always in my best interest. Always in my best interest. So actually, that fits in your book. You go out to the C-suite and CEO of Xerox very in an unusual way, not through finance, not through law, uh, but through manufacturing. So that also made you somewhat of an outsider amongst your peer group of Fortune 500 ex other CEOs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that, that was very different than a Boeing or a GE or companies like that. Yeah, I think more engineers should be CEOs, by the way. And we would have probably more. Noted. Yeah, <laughs> more logical thought. I, I, you know, I just went to be, I became an engineer. How did I become an engineer? Because I was good at math. That's literally the entire association. I went to all-girl uh, Catholic high school here, Cathedral High School on 56th Street and 1st. And I went to parochial grade school. And we had, it was a, we were poor and the school was okay. The grade school was okay. Cathedral turned out to be great, but it was very narrow, right? We, my classes were belief in Jesus. I had a class called that. I had a, bla a class called marriage. I did not have a class called calculus. <laughs> but I didn't need a class called calculus. I needed a class called belief in Jesus and marriage, right? Because it was not about only what they taught, it's the way that they taught us, which is to learn how to study and read, to learn how to write, uh, to just learn how to articulate debate. So it was a great place. And I took a, the, the normal things that you take, you know, you take, go to a guidance counselor, which were all nuns, and they said, three choices you have here. You could become a nun, you could become a, and I, this is not a lie, a nun, a teacher, or a nurse. Those were the options. This was in 1970, 1970. Nun was absolutely off the table. I had flunked <laughs> all of the pre-nun courses. I definitely didn't do that. Uh, nurse was not on the table either, even though I kind of liked the idea of medicine and being a doctor. And teacher was option. It was an option. I said, this is a place I could probably go. And then I looked in the Barron's book, and they told me what a teacher made every year. And I said, there's no way I could do that. I mean, literally, my family was, my mother was poor as hell, and the number one thing I was going to do was get her out of where she was. And I wouldn't be able to do that as being a, being a teacher. So in that same book was the number one highest paying degree after four years of college, civil engineering. No, sorry, chemical engineering. So I said, I'm going to be a chemical engineer. Period, end of discussion. Had no clue what the hell a chemical engineer did, what you had to study to become one. Sounded really great. I looked at all of the schools that did chemical engineering, and I went back to my, great, my high school and said, okay, I'm gonna become a chemical engineer, and here are the schools that I'm going to apply to. And it was the most competitive schools. You know how the Barron's book lays it out? Those were the eight I was gonna apply to. I actually applied to 11, 
most of them are like, I actually ended up getting into all but two, all on this one program called the Higher Education Opportunity Program, which means that you had potential, but you hadn't taken any of the precursor classes. So they stuff you in these things over the summer to catch you up. Anyway, long story short, I didn't like chemical engineering. I loved mechanics and mechanical engineering. Became a mechanical engineer, studied mechanical engineering and literally loved it. I actually liked what I studied and wanted to do it, to, you know, to actually practice it. And I went to Xerox. I worked at other places in the summers before that. Last summer I worked at Xerox. They told me to get my master's degree. I got my master's degree at Columbia. Went to work for them. And for the first six or seven years, I was an engineer in the lab, you know, working on very specific problems. Loved it. It was great. But it was really, my husband is the one who told me, it was kind of like only one portion of the company. And I knew nothing about the company. I knew absolutely no idea what the heck we were doing out there, who we were selling to, how we made money, who the leadership of the company was. That was during a time when you couldn't Google who the CEO, who the CEO was. You had to go to a, you know, annual report and look right. up the leadership team. There's no way to really tell them. We didn't have computers. It was just a strange, a different time. It was the last century. The last century. It was literally the last century, right? No, not quite. That school was right here on 55th. 56th right? and 1st. Right. Yeah, right up the street. And then we graduated at St. Patrick's Cathedral. I just went back there. So in looking at that, <laughs> what can you talk to us? Even though we're, we're in New York, it's a financial capital, but the whole idea of manufacturing in America, yeah. you know, you're yeah, so at the I, intersection of technology, tech company, manufacturing company, and... I did it in the right order, I think. I actually found something I really loved by accident, however I got there. Um, did it for a while, so I, you know, and understood what it take to do it. So, you, so I knew a lot about the inner workings of the company. Didn't have any um, thought about running the place, or even understood that kind of a structure. And stayed in that world for four or five years, and then got plucked out, primarily because I was vocal about things, about the way things were, not you know like how our labs were organized or staffed, for example, how women, how few women we had, how few black people we had. This is well before, uh, this is when we still call things affirmative action, right? We didn't call it diversity, equity, and inclusion, we called it affirmative action. So I was fairly outspoken in these areas, and that, that different, that ability to speak out got, my, got me on the radar of some executives at Xerox. I had no clue who they were, and they were black, white guys. And they were all from the Midwest, and so I was, I was, you know, I was dedicated to stay in engineering because I was really good at it, and I had kind of made my name, and I liked it a lot. And this one guy pulled me and said, "You, you should learn more about the company." My husband said that too, but he wasn't my husband. I was flirting with him, so I didn't, you know, didn't didn't take any of his advice. I just kind of. You know, was flirting with him. This other guy. That was then. You don't do that anymore. You, you don't flirt anymore. Well, that was that was co-employees. It's got a, it. <laughs> yeah, well, back thank God I lived back then. <laughs> you know, thank God I went through that back then. Anyway, he told me to come up and kind of talk to him. We got into a big argument in a big meeting. He asked a question. Somebody asked a question about why we're hiring all these these women and these black people. Literally, that was the question. Why are we hiring all these women and black people? Because it he thinks is lowering the standard of the company. This individual asked in this very large meeting. And the person who answered the question was a guy named Waylon Hicks. And uh, Waylon said, answered it really nicely. And then I raised my hand. And it's really interesting. I learned early, if you're the only black person or black woman in the room and you raise your hand, guess what? They generally call on you. <laughs> right? All you have to do is raise your hand. And it's really f interesting that you can see who you are because you don't look like everybody else. Raised my hand, Waylon, Waylon called on me, and I said, you know, I am absolutely insulted that you answered this question. And I really lit into him without thinking too much about what I was doing. And he answered my question respectfully and then said, I'd like you to come and see me. Literally, this is in front of a thousand people. I'd like you to come and see me um, next week. And my husband, who wasn't my husband, then said, the worst that can happen is that you're going to have to find a new job. So this, you know, this I'll back, I'll back, I'll back yeah, I'll probably get fired. Anyway, the great news was that this guy um, had, took an interest in me, and he said, you, did, you said the right thing, but you said it the wrong way. And you're going to have to learn as you go through your career how to say things in a way that people listen to you. Right? And that was, that's another lesson that was amazing. Because you don't want people to kind of 
you know, put up defenses on not the content, right? The content is what you want the, right. the focus to be on. So it's good. So being an engineer was really interesting because most of the people became, they were marketing guys or finance guys, a lot of legal guys running the company, running companies. And when you walk into a room and you don't actually know anything about the law, and you're not that interested in the finances, but you're interested in the way the company works or what they make to make money, you come with a completely different point of view. And it was, it's always been fun and interesting. Still to this day, there are very few engineers who run companies. Right. There should be more. Noted. <laughs> um, one of the challenges uh, you spoke about in the book, or you wrote about in the book, and it's, you just touched on, and that is, to be a manufacturer, there's a lot of emphasis right now on reshoring, bringing manufacturing back, bringing supply chains back. Um, that's a challenge for global companies, a challenge for Xerox. You know, a lot of politicians think, well, why can't you make everything here and just export it? Um, so can you talk about how you navigate that, which is very hard to do, and what do you see going forward? Because there is a certain <laughs> deglobalization discussion going on right now. Yeah, it's a big deal right now. Um, it turns out when... Uh, I, I write about this in the book, and Fred and I worked together for a couple of years because I was the vice chair and then the chair of the Export Council. He was the head of the XM Bank. That's the XM Bank, and we never got as much money as we should have from the XM Bank, but you know, he, was, he was a good partner uh, nonetheless. And one of the discussions that was swirling around back then, and even before, I, even before back then, but back then and now, is this idea that we should make more things here. And I always said, where is here exactly? Is here where we sell our stuff? Because if that's the case, we should probably make it everywhere in the world. Is here where we earn most of our profits or generate most of our revenues? That should be around the world as well. So this idea of here um, is a narrow perspective on what a business does. Right? We're dumb salt here, and by the way, we have a huge amount of affinity and therefore leaning towards the shore that we're incorporated in. But we make, at Xerox, when I left, we made as much money outside of the United States as we did in profitability. Revenue, for sure, more outside the United States. Profitability, probably about break even. So there's no way for me to actually say, go to Paris and say, by the way, I'm going to sell you my digital printing machines. And none of them are made in, in France. They're all made back in the United States. Just give me your money and I'll send it all to the US. So I think there's one, one problem is global companies are actual global citizens and have to actually operate on a global basis. That's one. The other one is that it doesn't make sense to actually financially to do it that way. I mean, it, literally, there are better sources of X or Y or Z in other places in the world. And so you should go to those places to get the best source. What has happened? a lot lately is that we've actually disconnected tax paying, um, profitability, a whole bunch of other financial metrics from where you're shored. And that's, we definitely have to fix this. Because there is, it doesn't make sense if you make all of your money in, or make most of your money in XYZ and you have a way to pay taxes to none of the people, right? Which is, it's very really happens that you pay taxes to none of the people, but you actually pay low taxes to the place that you have the biggest presence. Right. And that's a big challenge. Like Apple's music business is headquartered in Luxembourg. Last I checked, there are not a lot of great Luxembourgian musicians, songwriters, and uh, recording artists living in Luxembourg. And example. Xerox for a while, when I was running manufacturing, one of the things that we did along with everyone else is we moved some of our factories to Ireland because Ireland had given most manufacturing companies a, a tax holiday. I mean, how many machines could we actually sell in Ireland? Right. Not very many. So the, this kind of playing of the game, I do understand. And I mean, it's not breaking the law, but it is not easy to explain. And we have to be better at explaining it if this is what, if this is what we're going to do or stop doing it. Right. Uh, one of the things that John talked about in uh, <coughs> that the club is focused on is diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI. Um, and you've spoken a lot about that, how that's changed the conversation in boardrooms uh, on the three boards that you're on. So how, you know, no, I think there's been greater emphasis uh, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, the pandemic, 
a sense of fairness and equity. So how do you, how do you see how companies, and you're on three boards, how we navigate that going forward? Um, I'm on five boards, by the way, but I liked the sound of three better. Oh. <laughs> keep, keep saying it. I picked that up from CNBC. Yeah, I got the wrong you. data. Um, can't rely on that CNBC. No, you, uh, that's one of the problems, right? We can't rely on any of that stuff anymore. Um, you know, DEI is one of these things that, you know, I, depending on the mood I'm, I am in the morning, I want to talk about it or don't want to talk about it. Because right? it's just such a overused, it's kind of like cloud computing or AI. Everybody has one of those, and everybody has a DEI thing. The way that I think about it is that if you think of where we are in the world, right? Companies, not-for-profit organizations, educational institutions, arts organizations, everything, were designed by white men, all of them. There's not one that hasn't been. They were, the rules were written by right, white men. The judges were white men. So the people who determined whether you were following the rules were white men. Everything about the structures that we actually live in and we benefit from were, were built from the eyes, through the eyes of a certain segment of the population. And during the time that they were making these great investments and unbelievable strides, the positions of women and people of color, anybody like that wasn't like them, was a position of subservience, not either legally structured that way, almost always legally structured that way, but also socially structured that way, meaning they actually thought it and believed it, and so did we. So we literally, we, people who are not in that club, we've designed a whole world around these white men. And now we're starting to get a little bit like antsy. We're like, wait a minute now, I'm just as good and just as smart and half the population, you know, of women, 67% of the population is not white males, it's some, right. you know, the numbers. So we're now saying, wait a minute now, let us in. And what we're, What's happening is we're trying to let them into the structures that they built. And so we have to actually change ourselves to, to fit in to right. that world. DEI is about some of that change. It's about us, the people who are not in, understanding and making that kind of course correction that we have to make. But it is as much and more about this stru these structures understanding that they are unfair, unbalanced, that they are not set up for us. And it's, that's where the I part comes in, right? And I think that what we're, what's happening is everybody's focusing on like numbers and you know, we have to right. make, but it's more, it's as much about can we just step back and realize that we may have to kind of rebuild the building Right. I'm, I'm not. Oh, I'm not into my niece. My nieces and my children are into burn the whole damn thing down and build it. You know, I, that, that doesn't make it. a lot of young people are that way, good or bad. I don't know if that what that is, but I'm not there. But I'm, I know that if we don't make the changes to the structures that we have, laws that we have, what what looks good on the educational resume, all of that stuff, that we're going to have. If we don't do that, as well as the people who are excluded making changes as well to be included more, then we're going to have a war in the streets. And that's what we started to see. That's what we started to see around capitalism, this war in the streets, where people are like, this is not that system. I have no right. I have no rights in that system. So I have no respect for that system. I have nothing, no patience with that system. So we'll just turn it, tear it down. And that, unfortunately, we have nothing to replace it with that's any better. Right. This is the best system structurally, I think, around the world, we're just practicing in such a way that's getting worse, not getting better. So my whole thing about DEI is, yeah, this is not a program. This is not, right. let's, let's figure out a program. It's not an exercise. It's not an exercise. This is a literally step back, and we have some mental problems. We have to actually kind of go through counseling. We have some structural problems. We have to change the bathrooms, the, you know, the elevators. We have law problems where literally women are dis functionally discriminated against. And if you're black, we are not even allowed to teach a history in certain states now, because it's not the state American we live history. In. Yeah, the state that we live in. Yeah, I don't, I don't say that too loud. It's not American history anymore. It's now this special history that doesn't exist. There's so many things we have to kind of pull back from, 
and say, let's really, let's really look at what we are starting with. And I say to most CEOs who, who are still white men, the vast majority are still white men, be careful here, right? Because what they're, they can wink at DEI by, and, and try to do it without changing anything. That's right. basically what people are trying to do. Let's just increase the numbers. Let's make sure that those women go to these types of schools. Let's make sure that they, they study these kinds of things. And let's make sure that they do team sports so they can be more. All of this stuff is not fixing the problem. It's stuffing us into a system that's not built for us. And I think to get the most out of us, we have to do both things on both sides. We have to, we have to make some adjustments. And we have to understand, the white men have to understand that they're victims just like we are of a history that they did not build. So they have to actually be prepared to change it. Right. Most of them are not. Right. I think we're going to open up for the floor. <laughs> right here in the, a microphone is coming to you. And I, just for everybody, because we have some online, obviously your name and your affiliation. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Fred. Bal Das from BGD Holdings. Uh, I, I found profoundly resonant your reflections on de and uh, You know, as an Indian American, I was thinking of one of the th teachings I had taken away from Mahatma Gandhi, which I try to pass on to our kids also, is to be the change you want to see, which is structurally what your know, reflections are. You know, I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, as this process is going to play out, there is this overriding narrative of meritocracy that I, in business, uh, across the globe, by the way, particularly in, uh, without naming people, when I raise the topic, they say, look, I am blind. I just get the best talent. So this narrative of meritocracy, uh, it seems to me, when I hear you, it sort of is that shoehorning. So since you don't fit, I just pick the best. I'm not looking at color. I'm not looking at uh, gender. So there should be a amount of intentionality in practice. I appreciate your thoughts on it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's some, there are some buzzwords that are unbelievably racist. One of them is this, and sexist, is this word meritocracy. Think about what, I, as I said earlier, rules made by you guys, referees by you guys, the def definition of merit, right? This, this ladder, all around the structure, please realize this, that when this structure was defined, people who look like me could be owned by other people in this country. People who look like me could not vote. Women had, so this idea of meritocracy is kind of an interesting, I call it a buzz, uh, uh, Whenever people bring it up, it, you know, I literally, my hair goes up and I, my back goes up because I know what it's about. So I say the following. I just started with two partners, a private equity firm, which is what I do more than Teneo. Teneo is cool. I love it. Great company. Uh, fortunately, has a CEO and I'm the chairperson. And I love being the chairperson. I like being a grandparent, right? So, <laughs> so, so I'm not <laughs> It is unbelievably good, and I love it. I, I'm, I'm a principal in a private equity firm, a great one, that we just started called Integrum. And what we tried to do at this firm, we started it two years ago, was me and two partners. We wanted a firm that tore down all of the stuff that I talked about. The rules, I mean, some of the financial rules, we can't change it, but everything about what, is, what does good talent look like. No, they didn't know, they, you know, the good talent, what I was told, I had to go to Wharton or one of these 13 schools and then go work two years in this kind of a thing, private equity company being a slave, or investment bank being a slave, and then they leave and they go to another place and they go through all of this. I'm like, what? These are, this is training the worst things about people. Why don't we get some other people? Good analytical skills, but journalists, right? We have some social science people. We started this firm, very, very amazing people who don't look anything Mo a large number of them, the vast majority, the majority of them don't look at anything like any other private equity firm. Because talent is distributed relatively easy, evenly around the world, opportunity is not. 
So what we just had to do, we, I'm, I'm not that concerned about the talent or the, um, the merits of the people that I hire. I'm not concerned about that. I'm more concerned about whether or not we can give them a good opportunity to fit in and do the right things. And so I, I use that example because it's possible to build, it's possible to build and rebuild an organization where meritocracy is even redefined. And I don't mean that you go to college and get Fs and then you, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about not everybody's gonna be able to go to Harvard. By the way, thank God, right? Not everybody's gonna go to MIT, thank goodness. But they, those people who don't have that opportunity have the, should have the right and the ability to actually participate like the people who did. And that's why this idea of meritocracy, because it's still, it's, it's wrapped in this very sexist, very racist construct. I don't, I don't buy. And last piece, and then I, I used to have this great friend, he's still a good friend. Um, he ran a company called Motorola. Unbelievably good man. Like him, he brought me to, when I was new CEO, he was a CEO as well. Both were about the same age. I went to his place in Chicago to speak to his leadership team and a whole bunch of business executives. He introduced me by saying the following. This is Ursula, Ursula Burns, very good friend. And I, she, I don't see color or gender when I look at her. And I got up on the stage and said, how, I mean, this is the biggest insult I have ever heard. If you have to introduce me and position me in a place that takes the essence of who I am away from me to make me valid, my goodness, how, how terrible is that? You should be able to say, here's Ursula Burns. This is this woman from the Lower East Side of Manhattan who happens to be black. Fine, if you want to say anything about the description of me other than my name. But to say it in a way that you can defend, that you have to defend the fact that I'm there as something that's merit that is a merit-based thing versus the other side is absolutely amazing. We do this all the time. Men do men, white men, even we do it. Say we got there because of how smart we are, not because I'm a woman and not because of I'm like, really? I got there because I'm a woman. I got there because I'm black. I got there because I'm Ursula. All of those things. I don't I shouldn't have to pull any of them apart to be part of this club. And if, but we are, these kinds of conversations are happening now in companies, in boardrooms. They are starting to happen now. They're starting to realize how structured this conversation and how subtle this conversation has become and how they must change everything about what you think about what's acceptable. Board diversity, we started this thing called the Board Diversity Accident Alliance right after George Floyd. George Floyd is murdered. Um, I live in London, I moved to London <laughs> in 2016, December, with my husband, because in 2016, November, a man was elected president of the United States who actually said out loud to people like me, we don't like you. You're not really one of us, you don't really deserve. So my husband and I said, okay, this is, we can go, we can find a place that will take us. So we moved, everything, lock, stock, and barrel, moved to, moved to London. <laughs> At that point, right, that we were exiting and emptying our presence here, we had to reestablish, we had to determine how we participate back here. If we participate back here, how we participate back here. And for the first year, we felt it was such a great thing. We just said that that crazy country, you know, we're just going to build another world somewhere else. Re not realizing, but of course we realized that Racism is everywhere, sexism is everywhere. And we, end, we end, had to end up building a bridge back here to, to make sure that we could eventually, eventually come back here and actually participate. We participated more from London back for voting rights, for education rights, than when we were even here, coming back here. I don't know why I went down that point, but it, it, it's this whole idea that, that so George Floyd gets murdered, this is where I was gonna go. He gets murdered, I'm flying back from here to London and he's killed during that flight, you know, when I was out of context. And a guy, really good friend of mine who ran a massive sporting goods company, sporting apparel and goods company headquartered in, in Europe that begins with an A, <laughs> called me and said, you know, I picked up my phone, he said, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, great, how are you doing? He said, um, 
you heard about this thing? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about it. I just landed. I heard about it. He said, well, there's protests happening. He said, it's different. There are protests happening everywhere. Where he was, there were protests happening. This is in Europe. I won't say the city. Protests happening as well. He said, I'm a little confused about what's going on. This is a little different. It feels a little different. Like, it's not just Americans ranting and raving about police brutality and killing a black man. Everybody's kind of lining up on this whole thing. What do you, what, can you tell me about this? What do you think? He was a great friend, and still is. And I, my, my response was, sure, sure, sure. I'll talk to you about that, but why aren't you calling like your, one of your board members or like some of your management team? He said to me, I have no board members who are African or black, and I have no, none of my management team is. I said to him, and then, so anyway, we go through this whole thing. It's great. We have this great conversation. Very active, very smart man. And I hung up the phone and realized, think about this. This is a company that sells to young people all over the world, but uh, in America, disproportionately to African-American boys and girls. Right. He has nobody on his board. Or management team. Or management team. Nobody. And it was totally fine. He said, I had a Chinese guy. He had some Chinese people on there. I'm like, fine. This is pretty good. He was defend. And that's when I realized that, let me tell you, what, we, we started this thing called the Borough Diversity Action Alliance. Simple. With Teneo, Ford Foundation, the ELC, a couple of other partners, to just do one simple thing. We're not going to do religion or you know, map you and track you every single year. One thing, simple report. Do you have any people of color on your board? Pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Do you have a program that teaches and talks about diversity, equity, and inclusion in your company? Okay. And the third is, if you have one of anything, are you on path to get the, sec the second? Simple, simple, simple. And we're not going to come back and ask you every year. We're not going to put you in the newspapers and you know, with league table, tables. And then we're going to turn it over to your consumers and to your employees and to your investors, and those three groups are the people who can judge you from this point forward. By the way, we find out to get the data that I just said, you would think, oh, you just type in diversity on boards or something, and out would come numbers. Guess what? No numbers anywhere. By the way, private equity and venture, zero numbers, zero tracking, at least in Public companies, you can get the annual report if they have pictures. And if they don't have pictures in the annual report, there's a reason. There is a reason. But anyway, if you have pictures, you can actually make a guess, right? I can say, this is a female, even though that's even getting hard. But you know what I mean. And you can, say, you can kind of make a, a guess about ethnicity. But that's kind of what we had to do. Because you send it out and say, can you report this? And the first thing is, what are you going to use it for? People didn't self-declare. So anyway, this whole thing about the fact that you actually can, we can govern the whole universe, consumer goods, tech, government structures, everything, without having anyone that doesn't look like you participating is another fallacy that I think that we're starting to learn. That boards know this. Boards know this. They're still struggling on how to fix it. But they're, they are aware that to make their company future ready, they better do some things. It's hard. One last piece on this. I was on Andrew Ross Sorkin, who I a great, great guy. He interviewed, was interviewing us about this BDAA thing. And he said, so you know, these people are going to be really upset about you taking their seats. I said, their seats is an interesting characterization. They own these seats? We actually even think of it as their seats. Right? The women are going to take some of their seats. This is not their, they're human being seats, the last I checked. So they're taking some of our seats by definition, but there's a, it's a strange, the, the entire construct. My whole point here is think differently about the entire construct. There is no righteousness and permanence in this kind of a thing. Sorry, guys. <coughs> As John comes up, I'll, in addition to this great book, I hopefully got a taste. Uh, there is a book called The Tyranny of Merit, which is I love exactly I love what you're talking about. Tyranny and of Merit, wonderful, uh, wonderful, it's, wonderful. It's book. very worthwhile read as well. 
John, back to you. Well, this is an amazing conversation, and you're right, Fred, this could go on for many hours, and I wish we had could do that, but we are out of time now. Uh, and many thanks to both of you uh, for spending uh, this time with us. So this is um, the, the point which I talk about all the events we've got coming up. Uh, we've got an exciting year ahead of us. On February 22nd, we've got Richard Thaler, Nobel Laureate uh, from the University of Chicago uh, Booth School of Business. On March 1st, we have a luncheon with L'Oreal CEO Nicholas uh, Aeronymous. Joining him in conversation will be uh, former chair of the Economic Club of New York, Marie Jose Kravis. We'll have a luncheon with Jen Easterly, the director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency on March 23rd. Uh, that sounds very timely. And Robin Hayes, president and CEO of JetBlue on March 29th. And then on April 4th, we'll have our annual Women in Business Conference uh, together with the Consul Generals of Canada and France. And we'll be announcing speakers soon, so be on the lookout for that. And then on April 13th, we'll have a webinar with Dr. Ella Washington, organizational psychologist professor at Georgetown University. And finally, uh, we'll have Lee Ainsley uh, luncheon, uh, luncheon with Lee Ainsley, a founder, in, founder and managing partner partner Maverick Capital on April 13th. So when I say finally, that's for the next few months. Of course, we have a lot of other events we'll be, we're in the middle of planning for the rest of the year. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize the 361 members of the Centennial Society who are joining us today as their contributions continue to be the financial backbone and support for our club. And thank you for all of those who attended virtually and for those of you in the room, please, en for those of you in the room, please enjoy your lunch. Of course, people virtu uh, attending virtually can enjoy their lunch too. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.